they brought me in to show me some of the problems they were having and asked if they could hire me as a consultant to help with their hotels. And I said no, but that I would help for free and here's why. They owned uh, four self-storage facilities that they built from the ground up or developed. And I, they had put it in hotels and from hanging out with them locally and networking, I knew that they were really wanting to get back into the self-storage space in a big way. Welcome to the Next Level Income Show, where it's our goal to take your income, your investments, and your life to the next level. I'm your host, Chris Larson. If you haven't yet, get a copy of our book for free at our website, nextlevelincome.com. That's www.nextlevelincome.com. Just click on the book link and I'll even send you a copy if you put your address in. On today's show, we have Clint Harris. Clint is a professional real estate investor and entrepreneur and hails capital raising and investor relations at Nomad Capital. He owns Going Coastal Property Management and hosts the Truly Passive Income podcast, which I was just on. With a background in medical sales, like me, Clint built a lucrative multifamily real estate portfolio converting to high or converted to high performing Airbnb properties. Although he was frustrated with management services, so he founded Going Coastal Property Management to take that off his plate. For diversification, Clint transitioned to self-storage investments, eventually joined Nomad Capital as a general partner, and they buy old big box retail buildings and convert them to self-storage. Having raised capital for over $90 million, soon to be $100 million in stabilized assets, his mission is to inspire financial, location, and time independence for investors. You're in for a treat as we discuss Clint's story, as well as talking about the first time we met. Clint, welcome to the show. Thank you, Chris. I'm extremely excited to be here. Thanks a lot. Appreciate the invite. Oh, man, dude, your story is, it's inspirational. It is, it's, uh, it's a real testament to, you know, what people can do when they, when they set their mind to it and, you know, develop a plan and, you know, work hard. It's, and, you know, as, as we'll kind of share with the audience today, it's not magic. It's not luck. It's, it's putting things in place. Um, so Clint, I'd love for you to share a little bit about your background. Um, you know, I shared in the intro kind of what you're up to today, but you know, that intro doesn't talk about, you know, what you were doing really up to this point. I, I'm happy to share that before I do, I've got to say that, um, you're actually a pretty big part of my story. It's one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be here. So, um, it, it was a very, I'll get to that, but it was a very pivotal moment when I went to the best ever real estate conference two years ago, I was still in a pacemaker career and I'll, I'll talk about that, but it, Joe Fairless is the one that puts on the best ever real estate conference. For those that don't know, a uh, very inspirational guy and a mentor of our, the team that I'm working with, the general partner. So we got to spend a lot of time with him and it was great to, to get to know him and get to chat with him. But my interaction with you and your background and the way they intersected with where I was in my life, that you are the most influential person that I met from that conference two years ago. And it's had a big impact on me. So thank you for your story, what you've done. And I hope that all your listeners appreciate you the way that I appreciate you. Um, it's, it's amazing how it's come full circle. And I was really excited to see you again in this past year's best ever because my life had gotten turned upside down since then. And, and I watched the way that you did that the first time. So that was, uh, that was helpful for me. You, you may not know all that. So thank you for that. I oh, well, it. yeah, no. And, uh, you're, you're, you're more than welcome, Clinton. Yeah. I didn't know he was going to say, Clint, you're going to say that on the show today, but, um, again, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to hear that because, you know, I've shared the people that inspired me and I remember that conversation, Clint. And when you told me what happened here, you know, a few months ago, when we saw each other in Utah, I said, dude, you got to come on the podcast and talk about your story because, I think it's really easy, and this is this isn't just about like your story and talking about making the transition to an investor in real estate, but I think it's really easy when you see people that are successful and you say, "Oh, look, they they're lucky," or you know, all the cards got dealt to them um, that they needed. And people don't realize that success is not linear; it's a really bumpy road. So I think uh, you know your story can can uh, be a testament to that. Good. Well, I'm, I'm happy to share it. So I'll kind of jump in and share. Uh, my name is Clint Harris. I'm originally from South Carolina. I had a, a 16 year career in medical sales. I came out of college. I went to at the time there was one school in the country that taught how to implant pacemakers and defibrillators. And that's what I did. I, I went to that. Oh, wow. school. I got hired out early and I had a career uh, in medical sales as a clinical for several years and then as a trainer for several years and then as a sales rep. 
Uh, I worked in Columbia, South Carolina for 11 years and then took a promotion to become the lead sales rep of a team in Wilmington, North Carolina, which is where I am now. Um, so in during that process, as you know, Chris, that, that medical sales career can often be a young man's game. Grinding. It's it's you're taking call, you're working nights, you're working weekends. It's a lot of miles. You're all over the place. You're at the hospital, you know, six, six thirty in the morning, usually. So there's a, it's kind of a young man's right. game. And I always, always had a spirit, an entrepreneurial spirit that, that specifically drove me to real estate. My wife and I had built a small portfolio of nine single family properties, which turned out to not be that great in retrospect, but I lot, learned a lot of good lessons there. When we moved to Wilmington, we, uh, we moved to an area called Carolina Beach. Um, we tried a house hack. We, we bought a duplex blocks off the water. We did a renovation. We moved into one half, which is a three bed, two bath. Uh, we converted the other three bed, two bath into an Airbnb property. Love that. Accidentally did really well with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, that property paid our mortgage taxes, insurance, utilities. And, and on top of that, obviously seasonal, but it, it paid us about 1400 bucks a month to live there. So it's like, okay, this is, this is real money. I can see this as a pathway to the point where I love my job, love what I was doing, love the doctors, the patients, and the staff that I was lucky enough to work with. But if there's ever a day I don't want to do that, this is a pathway to get there. So over the next couple of years, um, we continue buying multifamily properties, and we have 14 Airbnb units we own now. Um, we awesome. built a house for ourselves. Thank you. Built a house for ourselves, moved out of that duplex, turned it into a rental unit. We have three quadplexes and a duplex, so 14 units total under four roofs. Um and I had I had a pickle on my hands. I had painted my, myself in a corner with an asset class that was wildly active. You know, there's all the you, you, passive income is, has turned into a buzzword that you hear of. Oh, get an Airbnb for a side hustle as passive income, or start a, a drop shipping Amazon store. It's it's marketing nonsense by people that are trying to sell you something, right? So. By the time that we had reached the financial level of success, where my wife had left her job in medical sales and was a full-time realtor, a lot of that spurred on by our success with investing. Then I had my career, and now we have third career you know, income coming in from these properties, but it was wildly active. And so we were the nights and weekends. And what, you, like, what you mean is you, you, were, you were doing it all yourself. It was, yeah. Right. Yeah. So by then, we were, we were just starting to build that out, and there was another on the island that had their own properties. And we we did partner on one of those together. So we had a little bit of help. But ultimately, I started looking around for a property management company that we could turn this over to. And nobody was getting the same numbers that we were getting. So that's the problem of like when we tried to learn how to be really good operators. And I felt like we had success with doing that. But then we were unable to find anyone else who would mind my business the way that I mind my business. Because they're managing 200 doors their job is like they rent it out. If it rents, it rents. If it doesn't, it doesn't. They don't care. They make up for it with volume. My job was to squeeze every dollar I could out of a highly successful and operating small portfolio. So yeah. when I realized we weren't going to get there, way, we our options were to unwind that whole portfolio and sell it off or build a system that could manage that. So Love that. Yeah. we did that with our partners. We started a property management company. And we built that out and that currently manages my 14 units and another 80 units. And then that turned into a linen facility and a cleaning company. And and now at this point, it took us about 18 to 24 months to build that out. Now people look at it and they're like, oh, that's passive income. No, it's not. <laughs> it is, yeah, it is residual yeah. income. Yeah. Right. Great point. We front loaded so much of the work yeah. there. I think that there's a lot of people in life that you look around and you compare yourself with these successful people in your life and you see what they have. And it looks so easy. A lot of times, you know, I can look at you, Chris, and I'm like, boy, you're rolling. You're like, you're being high efficient. You're getting all these things done. You're involved in all these different assets. The reality is like what you see is the easy part. Like there's a lot of years and a lot of experience and experience we all have gotten from other people that kind of pushes that forward. So when it looks passive, the reality is from my portfolio, it's not, it's just residual. And That's luckily great, at this point, point yeah. I'm not trading time for money, but I, I paid that time up front. Yeah. So that's a great, that's a great point. And um, 
before we before we kind of talk about what you're up to today, Clint, I think a few things for we have a lot of people from the medical industry, you know, doctors, surgeons, med, med device reps as well. For those that don't know, you know, that and that's pretty unique, Clint. I, I've never met anybody that actually went to college to learn a specific aspect of the medical device space like you did. There is there are specialized training programs like post college that do that, but that's really cool. Um, so for those that don't know, you know, the medical device industry is parallel to the the medical space, the surgical space. So people like Clint and I would go into the OR, we would make sure the equipment was there, the staff was trained, the contracts were in place, the prices were negotiated, everything was set up so that the surgeon could walk into the room, do the surgery, all the equipment was there, and it was all ready for the patient. And then, you know, you don't see, you know, hopefully the surgeon doesn't have to see what, what goes on behind the scenes. So for those of you that aren't aware, the um, kind of the, the dark side of the space that you alluded to, Clint, the dark side of the industry is that, you know, if, if you're on call, like we were, I was on call for 12 years of my career, you're on call when every surgeon you work with is on call. And I worked an average of, I calculated out six days a week, you know, during my career. Um, so we, we usually work on the weekends, you know, when we were on call, I was on call every other weekend. And um, yeah, I spent, I spent sometimes days straight in the hospital. Um, and I, I like to tell people that, uh, it kind of chips away at your soul. You know, you said it's a young man's game, you know, it, it kind of wears you out and you got to be cognizant of that. Um, and uh, I had a plan as you did with uh, real estate. If you would tell me, you know, when did you come up? You said you were entrepreneurial, but when did you buy that first property and why? I bought my first property in, it, well, the why is because it was the post 2008 crash and okay. everything, everything was super, super cheap. And I had a, you know, relatively good income at the time when a lot of people couldn't borrow money. I, I had money and, and I had good credit and I had some cash. So my first property was a duplex, believe it or not. So it was, it was, I'd never heard the term hacking. I thought I invented this concept and turns out people have been doing it for a thousand years, but I bought a, I bought a little historic house in Columbia, South Carolina that had other in law suite uh, with it, another unit. And I rented it out to, to a friend of mine and yeah. I was living there for free. Yeah. 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 I, I thought I was a genius. Like, there was probably a dozen people within a mile of me doing the same thing. Yeah, but that's no, but, that's uh, brilliant. I love that. Stra that's one of my top strategies for new investors. It's fantastic. Yes, yeah, so I was early 20s. Uh, and then because of I didn't have a mortgage, I was able to save. Um, from there, at the you could pick up little brick houses for 30 grand. I'd be all in 28 oh, to $30,000, so yeah. all in with decent roof, pick, you know, pick them up and be all into it, renovate it for like. 35, 37,000. And on paper, it looks great. Like it's, it's not section eight, but it wasn't much. And, and on paper, it's going to cash flow. It's, it's yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's, and it was over the 2% rule. Like they're written for 800 bucks a month amazing. and you're into them for 30 grand. It, it, it sounds amazing, right? Yeah. Until, you know, if you have headaches with one of them every few months and then multiply that by nine of them, how many headaches do you have? And it, it was sad. The reality is like every time somebody moves out, the CapEx, if you go in and the little kid's bedroom door is kicked in or the appliances are torn up mm, and all yeah. the capital expenditures cannibalize your cash flow from the year yep. and they're in things that aren't really going to appreciate over time. Yeah. Now, one or two of them did end up appreciating, but most of them didn't. And on paper, it was a great paper. That, but then when you look at that, that tenant, they're not taking care of the property and a lot of that cash flow just evaporated overnight. And I sounded like every rookie, like I'm going to get 10 of them. I'm making $6,000 a year off of each one, you know, after all expenses. So 10 of them, that's 60 a year. Then I can buy two more year because they're going to stay $30,000 forever. And the reality was you got to the point that I had the realization so many other people had is that you, you can't get where you want to go with single family homes. It's not yeah. very scalable and you have to go bigger. Yeah. But this, well, this the is, lesson. Go. Go ahead. I, I was going to say that that first lesson of the first duplex that I had is why when we turned our lives upside down and we moved to Carolina Beach to completely start over, which was a horrible business move. We had opportunities to go several different places. We chose it the lifestyle because of the community, and it was a place where we would want to start a family and live our lives and just gamble on ourselves and bet that we could build the business there. 
Uh, but that first lesson I learned from that first duplex is the reason we did it in Carolina Beach with the opportunity for the first time to be in a market that would support a term rental property. And that kind of took us off down the road of building out those properties, building the property management company, and then being the conundrum of, number one, it's wildly active. Number two, we got hit with four hurricanes in three years at one point. And yeah. all of my eggs are invested in my properties and and the company that we own are on one island and I was very poorly diversified. Yeah. That's yeah, that's a good point. Um I want to underscore a few things here, Clint. So, uh number one, your mindset. Super important. So if you're listening and you're like, "Okay, I, I love what Clint's done. You know, I've been listening to you, Chris, but where do we start?" The first thing is mindset. You got to think like an investor. And I lo- I love, you know, whatever, you know, spurn that first thought. I've talked about that. You know, the, that thought comes in your head. You know, Robert Kiyosaki does a great job of talking about this in his books. But you got to think like an investor. Even if you have a career, that's okay. Think like an investor. How are you going to go find assets that are going to produce cash flow? And you mentioned something super important because real estate goes in cycles and we're going to have another down cycle at some point. And you mentioned you had stable cash flow. So even though all your eggs, quote unquote, were in one basket, as you just finished talking about, your income was in a different basket. And I think med- the medical space is a great industry, a great business to be in because it's a stable, it's stable from an income perspective. So if you're if you're building a strategy and you want to be a real estate investor, you know it it may be wise to have. Uh, a career in something else that that's not necessarily real estate. And then I talk about this in my book, which is, you know, you talked about building systems. You know, you said, hey, I had to build this business, you know, to get yourself out of that corner that you painted yourself into, Clint. So if you think like an investor, you think how to scale, you know, you build systems around that, you can eventually, and I love how you called it residual income. You can create residual income. You know, some people might call it passive income, but I love that uh, residual income that's coming off of that business. And the final thing I want to mention is, you know, you a lot of the things you talked about, we were talking about, uh, you know, our athletic backgrounds before this. And I think having the discipline, knowing that it takes years of work. So, you know, you watch an athlete on the field make a catch or make a play or the Tour de France just ended here recently and you see that performance you don't see the years and years of work that went in behind that and when you see that instead of assuming ask that person say clint how did you how did you achieve this this is why i love having you on uh, and talking about your story because there's so many lessons that are so important for people that are listening um but the the biggest lesson is you didn't stop there you you continued to take the lessons that you learned clint and you continue to build systems and scale to the business that, that you all are running today. That's right. We, and a lot of those lessons that I learned along the way are as things I stumbled on. And you brought up something I really have a strong opinion on that I want to throw out there. When I started my investing career in my early to mid 20s, I'm 40 years old now. So I was I was renting CDs and audiobooks from the library. There was nothing on Facebook or no networking groups or anything like that. I was getting the best resources I could, but in retrospect, they were terrible. And I was li- the realtor that I had was like the best investor that I knew. And like looking back on it, like is at best mediocre. I think the opportunity now for networking is so much better, right? Like back then, if, if you're asking yourself questions as an investor, it doesn't take long. If you don't have a network of people, the answer is, I don't know. And if the answer to your question is like, how do I build this type of portfolio or how do I reach financial freedom or replace this level of income? And the answer is, I don't know. That's okay. Because I don't know implies ambiguity and ambiguity implies a lack of education and education is free, right? Like think about your podcast and what you've done. You just said education is free. And that is something that has not always been the case, right? We can get all this stuff. We, you know, when people say, oh, education should be free, what you just said. It's right here in the palm of your hand, right? It's amazing. It's incredible. And and a lot of people have always had it. For those of us that didn't, it's it's groundbreaking. And, and think about what you've done with your podcast. You've turned yourself into a lightning rod of where you've got, you know, 50 of the smartest people a year that you can or, or more, 100, you know, depending on how many episodes you know, different podcasts are doing, that that person is coming to you to give you 30, 45 minutes or an 
of their concentrated experience, both good, bad, and ugly. And real estate people love talking about real estate, right? So you're putting yourself in a situation where you get concentrated experience from all these people that have a, a career of, of their learning and it boils down to like their core values and what they believe. So I, that's the number one thing is, is the lessons that I learned, I could have learned a lot faster if I had plugged into that. And it wasn't until after we moved to Wilmington my wife was still going back and forth to South Carolina that she turned me on to several real estate podcasts. And that was really where we, yeah, I know. Unbelievably. I married way up. So that was the first thing that turned us on to the idea of Airbnb and everything else. And most of the success that we have had, there's a few things that we've gotten correct through blind luck. Most of it was by plugging in education, by listening to other people's, uh, content that they're putting out of concentrated, you know, the things that they did right. When our business with our property management company finally took off, it was because I read the book, Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. And awesome then it book. was my book of the year. Two you know, years ago. Yeah. Awesome. Book. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah. That and also I'll throw the name Traction out there. Traction is as Traction we're building is our, our self-storage syndication, that's been really powerful. Yeah. But I was drowning. I was like, how do I do this? How do I do this? How do I do this? And this is trains you to like, you don't need to know how to do that. You just need to know who you have that does know how to do that. And when I let go and let the people in our company that were better operators than me do what they need to do, it took off and, and it grew faster than I ever could. And it's both like, it's a little bit, it's humbling for multiple reasons. Humbling because you have to learn to give up the, the control on some of those things yeah. because there are other people that were frankly better than me. And then it's humbling from the fact that look, look at the amazing people I'm surrounded. By. Like, look at the team that we have and how good these people are, and we all share a common goal and core beliefs. That's humbling in a whole different way, and it's beautiful. Yeah, and it's it's challenging, right? If you're an entrepreneur and you've done everything yourself, and you're going out and you're like, "Hey, I'm successful because I've worked hard, I've done all this stuff, I have the knowledge," and now you say, "Hey, I'm going to be successful at another level." I need to not do what's gotten me to this point. And that's what you're talking about. And, you know, just to underscore um, another gold nugget, in my opinion, that you put out there is another secret of success is having a, a supportive partner, having a partner that is on board with you and knows where you're going. And not only is, is okay with that, but is, is a hundred percent in support of that. Because when, you have a partner that says, Oh, Clint, why are you, why are you, you know, spending all this time doing this? Why are you doing that? Cause you're not going to see results initially. That's not going to get you where you need to be. You must have a partner that understands what you're doing and be supportive of what you're doing. Um, so Clint, what I love what you guys are doing today. Um, one thing you hear, especially this year is like, there's, there's no deals out there. Like, you know, I can't buy a single family home and, you know, make it work, make the numbers work. You know, you just mentioned, Hey, Columbia, South Carolina, the numbers worked for you where they might have not have worked in, in Raleigh, for instance. Um, you talked about house hacking. You talked about doing short-term rentals, which I'm a big fan of. Um, today, you guys have, have continued down this path and found a creative way to literally create deals that make sense for you and your investors. Let's share a little bit more about what you're doing with that. Absolutely tell you quickly how we got there. So I got to the point that I had 14 Airbnb properties and I knew that I had painted myself into a corner. I had a high level of risk because one hurricane could wipe out my yeah. whole portfolio and my business. I was willing to do that in the short term because the cash flow was significant. As long as I took that cash flow and quickly invested it into another asset class in different geography with different market drivers, I was okay with that. It had to be a fairly quick pivot, right? So I gave myself around three to four years, and it was a little over okay. the three-year mark that through our local networking, I had some friends locally who were in the short-term rental space. They started buying hotels and converting them to invisible service hotels, and they had some growing pains. And so they brought me in. These guys I just met locally having beers at the breweries at the different real estate meetups. They brought me in to show me some of the problems they were having and asked if they could hire me as a consultant to help with their hotels. And I said, no, but that I would help for free. And here's why they owned uh, four self storage facilities that they had built from the ground up or developed. And I, they had put in hotels and from hanging out with them locally and networking, I knew that they were really wanting to get back into the self storage space in a big way. 
And so I said, I'll help you with your hotels. But when you get back to self-storage, because I know you're going to, I want to be in. And I, I want to be a part of it. Uh, and they said, Another okay. Great lesson. So- <laughs> Another great lesson. Work work for free and create that value. You know, get the value in the in the education, the partnership. Awesome, man. Well, the funny part is they didn't really even need me. They needed my team. My team was awesome. I'm just... Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> You got to use what you got, right? If you got yeah. bacon, sell bacon. If you got sizzle, you got to sell the sizzle sometimes. But <laughs> the, the, I brought my men to help consult with their hotels, and they made some big changes and started having a lot of success. I had been looking around at different asset classes that would make me safer from where I was. And the when I went to the smart, wise, older guys that had a lot of success and asked what they were doing, it was always three. It was mobile home parks. It was note lending, hard money lending to house flippers and self-storage. I didn't have any interest in mobile home. I didn't have any capital to lend out to anybody. And so that left me with self-storage. And that's why when this opportunity came up, I was like, I will, I'll help you, no problem. I want in. So a year later, they called me and they're like, hey, Clint, it's time. We're done with hotels. This is what we're doing. And so, uh, so yeah, so they, along with me, I brought some of we we needed to raise some capital so i said look here's the deal let me go try to help raise capital in this deal uh and let's let's do it together from just a you know, small partnership standpoint so i did i went to my white coat community i work with a lot of physicians that to have success in real estate investing you got to have those three things right it's time it's experience and money and all of those white coat professionals they have time they have, have money they certainly don't have time and without time you can't get the experience but if we took their capital and invested it with the people that have the time and experience, we thought we had a chance for something beautiful to happen. So awesome. we bought a Kmart that had been empty for about 10 years in Reedsville, North Carolina, bought the building for $1.5 million. I know from listening to your podcast, Chris, that you are also a Sam Zell fan. Sam Zell tragically lost a few months ago, an yeah. incredible man, philanthropist, family man. One of the many famous quotes that he had is that, it, it, the bottom line, it comes down to buy things below the replacement cost because that's the base level, right? If you can get it for less mm-hmm. than you can replace it, your basis is starting off on the right. Yeah. So we bought a Kmart. It was 87,000 square feet. We bought it for $1.5 million. If we wanted to just go build that cinder block shell, it would have cost six point five plus the cost of the land. So wow. we bought it for $1.5 we put 2.5 into it. We're into the project for 4 million and the state value is around 9 million. Amazing. So we cut a hole in the front and the back. We gutted the inside. We convert to LED. The sprinklers were already, we put new AC units in, we painted it and we put 550 units on the inside and we turned it into a climate controlled self-storage facility. Uh, yeah, that, that really spurred off the beginning of the group that I work with. I got invited to be to brought on as a general partner. I was able to show that I could raise capital through that first deal. We brought in, you know, I think around 700 grand, little under 700 grand for that deal from, from capital partners and um, started uh, my partner started nomad capital. It's a father and son team that I work with Eric and Levi Hemingway, who you've met. Uh, I'm one of the general partners and we, that's what we do. We across the Southeast, we buy big box retail, Kmart's grocery stores, Walmart's in high residential, area with good visibility and underserved markets that are secondary and tertiary markets across the Southeast. We convert them to climate controlled self-storage with our last acquisition uh, about eight weeks ago. Once that property is stabilized, that pushes us over the $100 million in assets under management oh, mark yeah. in a couple months ahead of our, that was our two-year goal. So very excited about that. We just, uh, we launched a fund and uh, we have five-year goal of half a billion dollars under management and a 10-year goal of a billion and, and we're rolling. Awesome. awesome. Yeah. Dude, congratulations. That's a hell of a story. <laughs> Thank you. The last two years have been, you know, that all happened since I met you. So it, it was, there was a moment when I was standing there at that, this is, I, this is where I'll tell this. I ran into you just talking uh, in Denver and you were like, Kind of, was, I don't really know what I'm doing here. I don't see where I fit in. We're just, I'm just met these guys and we're just buying this first Kmart and figuring this yeah. out. And it's a room full of all these amazing people. And I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a medical sales rep. I sell pacemakers. And you told me your background story about not only the way that you did this on the side and built an exit strategy for yourself and basically an off ramp from a life where you're constantly trading time for money. 
And if you know what the ceiling, it's a high ceiling, but there's a ceiling as to what you can make there. And one of the fears that I had is that it's such, it's a high enough paying career that I will never have the guts to try to do anything else. And it's that golden handcuffs that you can get locked into. And I was worried about that. And your story of you put together a sales plan, you took it to your management and you made an easy transition. You did it the right way for your doctors, your patients, your staff, your company, and everybody and kind of made a transition that resonated with me. And there was a moment at that best ever conference standing in the lobby of that hotel, looking out at the mountains. And I was like, Oh man, I got to quit my job. <laughs> and it was a weird, it was a weird thing it's to say, feeling, but it was like, right? yeah. if, if I know what yeah. the ceiling is here yeah. and the upper ceiling is potentially unlimited and it gives me an opportunity to create the passive investment strategies that so many people that I work with every day are looking for and don't have the time or experience to go do that I saw it as a way to kind of bring those two communities together and at the same time put myself in a position to create time, location, and financial independence that gives me an independence of purpose, put me in a position to choose how the rest of my life goes. And and that meeting, my meeting you and a lot of other people there, frankly, changed the amount of time that I get to spend with my kids. And it changed the amount of time that I get to spend with my grandkids that aren't even a twinkle in my three-year-old and my three-month-old eyes right now. So I, I've got a profound sense of gratitude about this journey. The reason the asset class works for me is be naturally diversified across, you know, I went from all my eggs in one basket with a highly active strategy on one island. Now I'm diversified across asset class, different asset class, different assets, big brick buildings that have been there for decades. Think about it. There's a reason why for 30 years, people in that community drove to that store by their stuff. Now those same people are coming back to the same building and sometimes taking the same stuff and paying us <laughs> to put it back in there. It's not lost on that's me. a We're, that's a great story. Yeah, it's it's the truth. It's it's amazing the stuff you see people moving back into these yeah. units, and then on top of that, you're diversified across operator. You have different managers, different market drivers, and then frankly, this is the only asset class that I've seen gives you that geography, operator, asset class diversification, and also de- diversification across time because different projects mature at different time periods. So you can build a portfolio or a fund with the goal of creating that long-term passive cash flow, as well as events that oftentimes are coming by way of a refinance, which is non-taxable. It's just, it's a level of, first of all, passive and then diversification that is the total opposite end of the scale of where I was previously. Yeah. Uh, And Clint, your story is perfect because it's everything that we teach. It's everything that we talk about um, here on the podcast. It's, it's inspirational. If you're listening and you're like, where do I get started? Um, you've heard it. You've heard where Clint and I both got started. You can see different paths. The final point I want to make is that, you know, you mentioned this, Clint, you talked about going across asset classes. The real estate market goes in cycles. If uh, you haven't, go listen to episode 100 of my podcast and talk a lot about the cycles, kind of how I, I personally predict the future and, and look at different things to try to figure out what asset classes are going to make sense. Um, but you know that's that's a great point. You've talked about the evolution of your investment strategy, Clint, and how now you truly do have passive time. And I think this is a perfect exclamation point. Um, we're gonna we're gonna hang up here today, and you're gonna pack up and and sail for two weeks with your family. Yeah, that's right. I'm leaving. That it's been a little bit of a blur already. We've been packing for the last couple of days, so I don't know how crazy we are. But my wife and I, with my three year old son and my three month old son are joining my my friend and neighbor and taking his 65 foot boat um up from here up to uh stone harbor new jersey and, and eventually new york and the hamptons and we're going to jump off and come back he's going to be gone for a lot longer but yeah something that you never have the chance to do when you're selling pacemakers for a living and tied to your phone constantly yeah. Uh, yeah. and trading time for money so it's yeah. uh it's another big moment for me that it's just an exclamation point on making a pivot that was not easy to do and it comes with an intense feeling of gratitude. And uh, I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it, it truly is. And Clint, if people are listening, if uh, listeners want to find out more about Nomad Capital, they want to figure out, learn more about what you guys are doing in the future, what's the best way to get in touch with you all? Uh, the best way is you can go to our website, nomadcapital.us. Also, I'm happy talk with anybody and connect. I talk with investors all day, every day. It's clint at nomadcapital.us. 
And I also co-host a cast called the Truly Passive Income Podcast as well. So those are the three places you can connect with me. And I'm in investor relations and, and capital raising. So I am on the phone all day, every day talking to investors. And I love it because I'm a student of the game. And that's how we all get better. Oh, Clinton, we love it, man. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for sharing your story. We will certainly stay in touch and we will certainly keep track of your story and probably have you back on here in a little bit to catch you up with uh, where your next stop is. Thank you, Chris. Thanks so much. And thanks all you've done for me, man. I appreciate you. Oh, it's our pleasure. Thank you, Clint. Hey, Chris here again. I hope you found this episode valuable. Now I have one more thing to gift you. We have a page for my coaching clients where you can get a free copy of my book, as well as much more from previous guests on the show. Just check out nextlevelincome.com slash coaching to get a free copy of my book, audio book, and much more. I'll send you a copy of my book and cover all the shipping costs as a thank you for listening to the podcast. Also, please like, share, and take just 90 seconds to give us a rating on Apple Podcasts.